हेलो एवरी वन वेरी गुड आफ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग एंड वेलकम बैक टू क्रैक विद बी सो लेट स्टार्ट द बजट हाई लाइट टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द फ्यू मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स रिलेटेड टू हेल्थ एजुकेशन सम विल बी रिलेटेड टू इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर राइट सो वट हैव बीन द इम्पॉर्टेंट डिसीजन दैट हैव बीन टेकन बाय द गवर्नमेंट सम विल बी लाइक जस्ट फॉर जस्ट वन टाइम रीड सम विल बी दैट यू हैव टू फाइंड आउट दैट ओके in depth what you have to read i'll be telling you that okay in these kind of topics you should be reading in a little bit detail i'll also be telling you that what detail you have to go through fine so let's start with it first of all we'll be starting with health education and skilling in health education and skilling uh, there is not much of the initiatives that you can see but still we are going to read upon first of all you will be seeing that there are nursing colleges so obviously there are 156 157 medical colleges existing that established since 2014 now 157 new nursing colleges will be established in the co location along with the doctors related medical colleges we also re uh, require the colleges for nursing staff as well so this uh, particular initiative is for them next information that you should be remembering is government is targeting for elimination of sickle cell anemia by 2047 it will be launched universal screening of 7 crore people in the age group of 0 to 40 years so what you can remember is the elimination related target next teachers training district institute of education and training they will be developed as a vibrant institute of excellence for this particular purpose next is the component of the national digital library and under this national digital library there are various educational related materials that are available for at the various education requirements including your school education engineering related education etc right so now this particular uh, digital library they ha government has uh, said that we are going to set up physical libraries at the panchayat as well as the ward level so obviously you must be knowing that this particular initiative will be coming under the ministry of education now here some uh, interesting things or you can see that you have to will be reading that particular thing in detail now priority number 2 the priority number 2 that we have studied was reaching the last mile now in the reaching of last mile first of all aspirational district program please tell me quickly aspirational district program has been launched by which organization quickly I want you to. Uh, I want to know that aspirational district program was launched by which organization? This was. This is an old program. Anyone? Okay, at least fine. Say at least yes or no. You know it or you do not know it. good gaurav niti ayog yes isha good nivedita yes so it was launched by niti ayog first of all it was launched in 112 districts in the year 2018 by niti ayog right so whenever now this is also a tip for you guys whenever you are reading such kind of statements then you must be knowing that which particular entity has launched this particular program it is very important for you guys to know right it was launched in 2018 why it has been launched so we want to develop these most underdeveloped districts we want to look at education related criterias health related criteria sanitation related criterias in total all the development criterias will be looked at and these all districts will be developed so government is saying that we will be covering 500 blocks for saturation of essential government services okay fine now next is pradhan mantri pvtg development mission pvtg particularly vulnerable tribal group pvtg right now what are these pvtgs so let me tell you they are a sub class within scheduled tribes population
we call them as PBTG. Right now in India, there are 75 uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups that have been identified, right? Now you guys have to tell me, this is your homework, you have to find out in which state the most number of particularly vulnerable tribal group exist. This is your homework, you have to find out. There are total 75 PBTGs currently in India that have been identified. Why they have been identified? Because out of scheduled tribes population as well, these, this particular group is the most vulnerable. They are most deprived and hence a subclass has been created so that we can provide them essential government services specifically for them. Understood? Now, there is a Pradhan Mantri PVTG development mission. What we want to do under this particular uh, development mission, obviously we want to improve socio-economic conditions of the particularly vulnerable tribal group. An amount of 15,000 crore, it will be made available to implement the mission in the next three years under the development action plan for the scheduled tribes. Next thing is Eklavya model residential schools. Again, this uh, school is for the disadvantaged section of our society, uh, most uh, specifically for scheduled tribes, right? So this particular school in next three years, center is going to recruit 38,800 uh, 38, teachers and support staff for the 740 Eklavya model residential school that are going to serve at least 3.5 lakh tribal students. So you have to remember Eklavya model residential school, this is a scheme for the tribal people as well as the disadvantaged section of our society. Next scheme, water for drought prone region in the drought prone central region of Karnataka, there is a central assistance which is provided, not very important. Next moving on to PM Avas Yojana, the outlay for PM Avas Yojana has been enhanced by 66%. PM Avas Yojana we have already covered under, under our central government related ministries. Uh, schemes, right? So this particular thing we have already covered there. Then you have got Bharat Shared Repository of Inscription. Now it is important that you should know this particular short form, Bharat Shri. The question that can be asked is like Bharat Shri, this is the scheme for what? Right? So you should be knowing, uh, not very, uh, you do not have to require to go that much into that. Just please understand that Bharat Sri Shri is the scheme and it has been launched in order to protect the ancient inscriptions. Right? It is going to digitalize the 1 lakh ancient inscriptions and it is will be set up in Digital Epigraphy Museum. Fine. So, only the name as well as what is the purpose. These two things has to be remembered by you. Finally, moving to the priority number three, that is infrastructure and investment. So there will be various schemes, various initiatives that has been launched by government in order to look for the infrastructure and investment. First of all, capital investment. So you see, it is very important. Capital investment is being increased by the government for the third year and it would be 3.3% of the GDP. We have increased it to the tune of 10 lakh crores and it will be 3.3% of GDP. So in this particular piece of information, what is important for me? It is important that central government's expenditure on capital investment as percentage of GDP is 3.3%. This particular piece of data is important. Now, this will be almost three times the outlay in the 2019-20. Great. Next is effective capital expenditure. In our earlier budget sessions, we have read that what does effective capital expenditure means. So, suppose government is giving, central government is giving grant to the state government. These particular grants are a revenue expenditure for the central government. But state governments are using these grants for the development of capital infrastructure. Fine. So these will be called as the effective capital expenditure. Now let's see. The grants in aid which are given to the states. The effective capital expenditure of the center is budgeted at 13.7 lakh crores which will be 4.5% of GDP. Now, can you guys tell me that what is the difference between 3.3 and 4.5? <clears throat> it 
is 3.3% is included in the 4.5% or not? That is my question. I am asking is 3.3% is included in 4.5% or not? Or these are both exclusive figures. They do not have any relation with each other. What is the case? Any answers? So these are both different, right? The earlier 3.3% that is provided by, that is the expenditure which is being made by the central government. And the next that is 4.5%, this is in relation to the grants which is, provide, which is being provided to the state governments and hence this particular capital expenditure will be done by the state government. Moving on to the next point, support to the state governments for the capital investment. So to continue the 50 year interest free loan to state governments for one more year with a significant enhanced outlay of 1.3 lakh crore. So this 50 year interest free loan at the time of COVID as well. Uh, see government, central government, government, central government, what they do is they always try so, to in order to provide the funding to the state governments, fine. Now, in that particular case, what happens is, just understand this, at the time of COVID, health of finance in the state governments was very much low. So, at that particular time, the various schemes has been launched by the central government in order to provide the support, like your interest-free loan, apart from this, borrowing limits were enhanced for the state governments. So, that particular thing is being enhanced for one year more and if any state government wants to apply for the loan from the central government they can and for that budget uh, the outlay or the funding has been kept at 1.3 lakh crores next is a harmonized master list of infrastructure, it will be reviewed by an expert committee for recommending the classification and financing framework suitable for Amrit Kal. Now, what is this harmonized uh, scheme for infrastructure or list for infrastructure? See, what happens is every ministry is going to tell that, okay, these are the infrastructure related details and we want to develop this particular infrastructure. Now, having a list it makes it easy to finance that particular infrastructure to monitor the growth as well. So that particular initiative was for that. You, What you can do, you can just remember the name and what it is for. Next is railways. A capital outlay of 2.4 lakh crores has been provided for, to the railways. This is related to the capital expenditure, the highest ever outlay. Now next talking about the logistics. So 100 critical transport infrastructure projects has been envisaged under logistics. Now what are critical infrastructure, transport infrastructure projects? So that means roads, bridges, tunnels. Now why may they become critical? See, depending on the location, depending on the strategic importance of the area, depending on the that population of that particular area is not connected with the rest of the population, depending on all of these factors, a transport related infrastructure project, it becomes critical. So India has envisaged that 100 such critical infrastructure projects will be made. They will be taken up with a priority with investment of 75,000 crores, including 15,000 crores from the private sources. Next, you have regional connectivity, 50 additional airports, helicopters as well as water air roams will be made up. Now, can you guys tell me that there is a scheme, particular scheme for the development of airports as well as for the uh, making the air related transport cheaper for the common people, what that scheme is known as. Now, this is very easy. Please tell me. I don't want mum faces on this. The question is, there is a scheme related to 
एयरपोर्ट रिलेटेड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर डेवलपमेंट एज वेल एज मेकिंग द एयर ट्रांसपोर्ट एफिशियंट Dear IFSCA classes are going on in the paid course, so you can join that. Yes, Udan scheme. Yes, Ude Desh ka Aam Nagrik. Right. So that is the one particular scheme that has been launched, and under this, greenfield airports, brownfield airports, these are being developed. Next is Urban Infrastructure Development Fund. Now with that particular thing, now I have one more question with you guys. Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. It is managed by which particular entity? Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. This is managed by which entity? RIDF. So let me tell you, Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. This is a fund which has been made in order to support the infrastructure in the rural areas. How the funding is get uh, we get in this particular development fund? So there are priority sector lending norms on the banks, and if the banks are not able to fulfill their PSL norms, then they can purchase and they can deposit the money under this Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. Very good, Rushab. Very good, Gaurav. NABARD is the agency which manages the Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. Now, keeping this, uh, yes, Nevedita, Isha, good. Now, keeping Urban Infrastructure Development Fund, read it. in the light of rural infrastructure development fund this is a rural counterpart right now urban areas also need infrastructure so just like the rural infrastructure development fund a uidf will be established through the use of priority sector lending shortfall same sources right see until we have focused in rural areas why because most of our population has lived in rural areas but please understand urban areas also need infrastructure related support i'm not just talking about the cities which are well developed but i'm talking about the semi urban areas as well which do not come in the criteria of rural fine so uh, this will be managed by the national housing bank and it will be used by public agencies to create the urban infrastructure in the tier 2 and tier 3 cities so as i have mentioned i am not talking about the tier 1 cities i am talking about tier 2 tier 3 cities rupees 10000 crores per annum will be provided for this purpose now see this is the <clears throat> basic fund that will be provided by the side of government this fund will be uh, what you can say replenished by the priority sector lending shortfall so this support has been provided by the government now this is not just the only fund that will be having under uidf this particular fund will be supported by the priority sector lending shortfall as well fine now urban sanitation all cities and towns will be established uh, enabled for 100% mechanical desludging of the septic tanks great next is unleashing the potential now mission karmyogi the government has launched an integrated online training platform i got karmyogi now do you guys know that what does mission karmyogi means any idea so this is mission karmi yogi is for the training as well as appraisal of public servants so there are ias officers there are state civil services officers right these officers they need training so till now what was happening was they did not have enough as well as the quality training once they have gotten into the organization now uh, in earlier times no training was provided to them but under the mission karmi yogi we are going to provide the training to them this is the scheme for that now for enhancing the ease of doing business more than 39000 compliances they have been reduced more than 3400 legal provisions has been decriminalized and for furthering the trust based governance we have introduced the jan vishwas bill by amending the 42 uh, central acts 
right so jan vishwas bill has been brought by the department of promotion of industry and trade right so this has been brought by department of promotion of industry and trade jan vishwas bill and along with it why it has been brought in so there are 42 central acts like your trademark acts right and any other particular acts of the central government they these acts are under uh, some odd 19 to 20 ministries so you do not have to remember that what acts has been covered under it but just remember which particular department and ministry has launched jan vishwas bill correct they have launched it why they have launched it see in various kinds of act like your ports act trademarks act what happens is there are penalties as well as punishments for the small small mistakes right suppose you have not provided the return then there is a penalty as well as the sometimes uh, uh, penal provisions are also there that you will be deposited in the jail such kind of provisions are also there so these provisions has been decriminalized decriminalized means criminal action will not be taken on to you if you are going to do this mistake obviously civil action can be taken like amount related penalties will be levied on you suppose you have not filed a return just example so uh, for 2000 rupees penalty will be levied on to you but for that offense you will not be uh, there will not be any provision that you will be sent into the jail such kind of things are not will not be there see what happens is when there are some kind of uh, penal provisions and there are criminal obligations on to the person it hampers the growth of business enterprises right so for that for that purpose jan vishwas bill has been brought in now next is center of excellence for artificial intelligence for realizing the vision of make in india as well as make artificial intelligence work for india three center of excellence for artificial intelligence will be set up in the top educational institutes like your iits iims etc there will be three artificial intelligence related institute now what is artificial intelligence please understand that artificial intelligence means when machine works as and it imitates the human intelligence power obviously it cannot as of now it cannot totally replicate the human brain but still it tries to mimic the human capabilities and that comes under your artificial intelligence we want to research more on this particular artificial intelligence related thing and for that there will be center of excellence will be developed now national data governance policy it will be brought out next common business identifiers the pan will be used as a common identifier for all digital systems of the specified government agencies please remember this pan number it is a common identifier it has been made a common identifier fine next vivad se vishwas number one relief for msmes so what happens is you already know that our high courts as well as supreme courts they are overburdened with the cases along with that departments of the government they are also burdened with the litigations now we want to remove these litigations we do not we do not want to fight unnecessary cases so any particular case any particular problem which can be resolved through mutual understanding for that, these particular Vivatse Vishwas, these schemes has been brought in. These schemes has been brought in in income taxes as well. They have been brought in under your indirect taxes as well. So these are the government's way of resolving the cases on its own, on an administrative fund front. So in case of failure by MSME to execute the contract during the COVID period, 95% of the forfeited amount relating to bid or performance will be returned to them by the government as well as the government undertakings. Because MSMEs were not able to perform, there were problems. There were problems em emanating. Why? Because the MSMEs, they were wanting their payment and government agencies earlier, they said that we cannot give it because you have not provided and you have not supplied us with the uh, product at the particular time. 
So in order to resolve this particular dispute, government has decided that Vivas Te Vishwas won relief for MSMEs. Remember that Vivas Te Vishwas, this has been a scheme for the direct taxes resolution as well. Fine. So right now, this is for giving the relief for MSMEs and what kind of relief you have already seen this. Now, few more things that are important. Vivas Se Vishwas 2, setting for contractual related disputes. So, relief number 1 was for MSMEs and it was for relating to the, if they were not able to supply the products on time during the time of COVID. Now, this particular Vivas Se Vishwas, if you have got any contract related dispute, you can reach out to the government and you can ask for the resolution of the same. Moving ahead, result-based financing. Result-based financing, the financing of few schemes, it will be changed and it, on pilot basis, it will change from input to result-based. Right now, this is not very important because it has to be decided on pilot basis what kind of schemes will be changed. So, please keep it on the hold. Next is e-courts. E-Courts for Efficient Administration of Justice. The Phase 3 of E-Courts project will be launched with the outlay of the 7,000 crores. What we are going to do under E-Courts, so we have seen at the time of COVID, all the government departments as well as the Supreme Court and the High Court, they were not able to function properly. So with the E-Courts facility, what we want to do is, we want to digitalize all the cases related data. First thing, if you will be having a digital copy of your case related documents, then it is easier for uh, the judges as well as the administrative machinery in the Supreme Court as well as High Court to decide upon a case. First of all is the digitalization of the case related data and then we are also supporting the video conferencing related facility for uh, holding up, uh, holding the Supreme Courts as well as the High Court sitting. Why it helps? Because it helps with you at any time. If you do not, if I suppose you have to hear an urgent case and the judges are not available. But if video conferencing related facility is available, digitalization of data has been done, then you can obviously always listen and hear out the cases. So that is the benefit. Fintech services have been facilitated by our digital public infrastructure. Now, Aadhaar, Jandhan Yojana, Video, KYC, India Stack as well as UPI, DigiLocker, it is going to be set up for use of MSMEs as well as large uh, businesses and charitable setups. So, till now, individuals were having the facility of DigiLocker. We uh, used to deposit, uh, we used to uh, have a single repository for all our identification related documents. Now for entities also this kind of digital locker has been envisaged so that MSMEs, any kind of trust as well as businesses, they can also use this particular facility of digi locker. Next is <clears throat> lab grown diamonds. Just a small piece of information that uh, Machines as well as to reduce import dependency, research and development grant will be provided to one of the IITs for five years. See, understand this. India has already have a burden of uh, <clears throat> essential imports that is crude oil. We cannot reduce it. But if we have to control our current account deficit, if we have to control our balance of trade related problem, then what we have to do is we have to control our imports on the unnecessary items. And for that, India is a uh, has started this lab grown uh, diamonds facility as well as if you remember we have talked about sovereign gold bond schemes right such kind of schemes has been launched so that people who are interested in uh, making an investment in the gold they can make an indirect investment which is linked with the gold and they should not purchase gold why because uh, gold is again it has a finite quantity Correct. It is very limited in quantity and India does not have enough gold fields for that and we have to import it. So this, this becomes problematic for us. Fine. Next is green growth. Now 
you people are also witnessing climate is changing right climate is changing day by day earlier uh, winters would uh, used to last till uh, first week of march but we have witnessed a humongous rise in the temperature in the month of february itself so obviously every nation they have to take the steps related to the environment because uh, we have just limited time in order to stop any particular catastrophe and for that particular matter green growth has found its as one of the priorities in our budget now let's see a vision for life or lifestyle for environment this is to spur a movement for environmentally conscious lifestyle india is moving forward firmly for panchamrit as well as the net zero carbon emissions by the year 2070 so net zero uh, various european nations they have promised that they are going to achieve the net zero by 2050 china has said they that they will be achieving the net zero by 2060 and india has promised that it is going to achieve net zero by 2070 do you guys understand what does net zero carbon emission means do you guys understand that what does net zero carbon emission means good so <clears throat> as much carbon you are uh, producing or you are leaving in the environment as that much quantity of carbon should be consumed by the ecology in your country's area fine so you should be growing the plants as well as the trees so that these plants and trees can absorb the carbon now it has got two ways to do this either limit your carbon uh, production or increase the carbon consumption any of one of them can be adopted next is the green hydrogen mission it is, has been provided an outlay of 19700 crores our target is to reach an annual production of 5 mmt by 2030 now why is the focus has been on green hydrogen mission so there have been hydrogen related cells they can be made as a alternative for providing the energy combustion related energy in your automobiles as well as the other sectors so when we uh, produce this the only residue that we uh, get is the water as well as your uh, heat right so these are the only left out which are left when whenever we will combust the hydrogen right in the presence of air and it is really truly a water efficient uh, water efficient sorry it is an environmentally efficient technology we are in this you are not leaving any carbon residue in the environment and hence there is focus see a uh, please focus 19700 crores because otherwise if we take more in rounding off that will become problematic now next is energy transition this budget is providing 35000 crores for energy transition energy transition means to transit from the coal based or any other uh, carbon producing based energy related uh, power sector to the environmentally sustainable and green energy that means we want to transit our uh, industry as well as the infrastructure infrastructure related sectors from the coal based or any such kind of carbon poor technologies to carbon rich technologies that means we want to focus them and we want to shift them to the renewable energy sector for that 35000 crores has been provided next energy storage projects so to steer the economy on the sustainable development path battery energy storage systems with a capacity of 4000 mwh will be supported with 18 viability gap fundings viability gap funding for and as well as the battery energy storage systems you want to improve the battery in related storages and for that any kind of research that will be done if you are whenever you are doing the research there is always a gap between the production that you will be doing 
fine the cost of production that you will be incurring and the revenue which you will be getting out of it so any kind of such projects which are focusing on the battery related storage capacity see we are moving towards the electronic vehicles right now uh, currently e uh, evs that we call as electronic vehicles they have got a problem related to battery we want to make that uh, we want to make the battery life a much more so that the electronic vehicles they can compare with the petrol as well as the diesel counterparts currently what we have in petrol and diesel we have got so many filling stations right so any any time when we are uh, going out of petrol diesel we can go and fill it but in electronic vehicles first there are two problems first of all the battery is not that much long lasting and the second problem is we do not have enough charging stations at different different points so only one thing obviously government should be work government is working on both these components government is working uh, for in enhancing the battery life as well that we are seeing under this particular uh, project and government is also working on the infrastructure related development like establishing the charging stations government is working on the, both of the fronts and hence government is providing the viability gap funding viability gap funding means the cost of production which you are incurring the revenue which you are getting obviously revenue in the starting you must be getting is very less so any gap which is coming government is going to help you regarding that <clears throat> next is renewable energy evacuation the interstate transmission system for evacuation and grid integration of 13 gigawatt renewable energy from ladakh will be constructed with an investment of 20700 crores including central support of 8300 crores see uh, renewable energy transmission related infrastructure is very much important now suppose in the state of ladakh you can have various kind of renewable energy related things like if you want you can also develop wind related infrastructure over there apart from that geothermal energy is quite abundant in the ladakh but what we also need is we need infrastructure if energy has been produced in the ladakh we transport it to we want to transport it to himachal or let's say to punjab or any other particular state so for that transmission infrastructure should be there just like right now we have for electricity related transmission lines we already have so we have to make certain upgradations in that certain areas in ladakh they do not have any kind of transmission infrastructure electricity transmission so we have to upgrade it we have to make it so uh, also ladakh was recently not recently but in the year 2019 it was made a ut so government is specifically focusing on the development of ladakh as well as jammu kashmir so for that this particular scheme has been launched evacuation means the renewable energy that we will be producing in the ladakh we should be able to transport it to the another states as well obviously all the energy produced in ladakh is not going to be consumed in ladakh itself fine next is green credit program this is will this is going to be incentivizing the sustainable as well as responsive actions taken by the companies individuals local bodies and help mobilize the additional resources for such activities if you are taking any environmentally conscious infrastructure related uh, project or if you have do, uh, done such kind of activity which is going to give a good impact on the organization suppose there is a company and that particular company has established a infrastructure that is promoting green growth like for example there is no compulsion on the company that uh, it should use solar power right but there is a company abc limited what this company has done they have uh, established solar power units in their cust uh, in their uh, employees uh, quarters right where the employees stay now all the power that is being consumed by the employees quarter it is getting they are getting from the solar power so now what this company is doing company is saving the electricity which is being supplied from the co power plants that are being operated on the coal so obviously it has activated a climate conscious 
decision it has taken a climate conscious decision and for that green credits will be provided to it and on the basis of that financing as well as some kind of financial support can also be provided to them in order to motivate them next is pm pranam pm program for restoration awareness as well as the nourishment of mother earth it will be launched to incentivize states as well as union territories to promote alternative fertilizers and the balanced use of chemical fertilizers. So, uh, India started to use chemical fertilizers as well as insecticides from the time of the Green Revolution. That means specifically from the 1966 onwards. Now, it does improve our grain related production, but at the same time, it is leading to so many diseases. It is polluting our water bodies, right? And the chemical concentration in our bodies is increasing day by day. Why? Because we eat such kinds of contaminated vegetables, etc. See, in India, uh, there is a specific ratio, right? like urea should be uh, put in the soil in a specific ratio but because urea is uh, uh, what you can say urea is cheap so what farmers do is they put excessive ureas right so what this leads to there is an increased concentration in the water bodies and obviously the vegetables which we are consuming is also going to have an increased uh, percentage of these particular chemicals so for that government is saying that please promote alternative fertilizers alternative fertilizers can you name me some kind of uh, schemes or some kind uh, anything which you know about alternative fertilizers there is a particular thing if you know about it Any other initiative? No. No, PM Kasum, no. Anyone else? So there has been a organic uh, farming related scheme. What do we do in that particular organic farming? So there is a scheme called as ZBNF or no, this is not a scheme. This is a way how agriculture should be done, right? So what we do is in, in it, we use uh, organic fertilizers, organic manure, right? That we receive from our plants as well as from our animal husbandry that is used as well as agriculture is uh, the irrigation in the agriculture field is kept at minimum or what is just required like that so these are the initiatives now the question that how ca we can reduce a carbon emission by transferring carbon credit to more polluted industries in any nation see this is a scheme that has been uh, that was discussed under the kyoto protocol right as well as it was also discussed under your Rio Earth Summit in the year 1992. What this scheme is, is this regarding carbon credit. Now, how does it function? So, suppose there is a uh, particular industry in one nation, right? And there is an another industry in another nation. Now, both of them are emitting 100 tons of carbon dioxide in the air. Just assume that. Industry A, or sorry, company A, company B. Both of them are emitting 100, 100 tons in the environment. Now, this company A has reduced its emission. Now, it is emitting just 50 tons of the carbon dioxide. Why? Because it has installed solar power related system. It has upgraded its machinery. Now, you see, there is an obligation on the other uh, company to reduce its carbon emission, but it is not able to do so. So what it will do, it is going to purchase those carbon credits from this particular company. Fine. And it will, it is going to show that, yes, we have purchased this and now see, we have reduced it. Now, the purpose of this is this company which has reduced its carbon emission by 50 tons, it is going to receive funding from the other company and 
if we see in total now the total carbon emission in the environment is just 150 tons and this company which has reduced the emission it is going to receive the financing and why this company is going to pay the financing because there are national rules which ask it, this company to limit its carbon emissions and if it is not going to limit its carbon emissions then what it can do it has to purchase the carbon credits and how it can purchase the carbon credits from any other entity which has reduced its carbon emission fine next is Gobardhan scheme so all these schemes they are supporting the natural farming just around now we have read that we are government is under pm pranam it is incentivizing the states to shift from chemical fertilizers to the natural ones or natural manures so there is an another scheme which is going to assist them in doing so and this is called as gobardhan scheme so it is a 500 new ways to wealth plants will be established under gobardhan to promote the circular economy so what is the circular economy so whatever is the waste that you are receiving from the agriculture or from your animal husbandry that particular waste you are going to turn into manure that this is this is going to give you two things first of all manure and this when this particular uh, waste will rot it is going to give you the gas biogas so you have got two solutions first of all you have got green manure and then you have got biogas now the biogas is it is going to help you in the energy related things as well as the manure is going to help you in the agriculture uh, agriculture uh, fertilizers related thing so this is going to include 200 compressed biogas plants including 75 plants in the urban areas 300 community or cluster based plants at the total investment of 10,000 crore in due course 5% CVG mandate will be introduced for all organizations who are marketing natural as well as the biogas so going forward see just uh, right now what we are doing on a pilot basis we have started mixing the ethanol with the petrol we have started mixing the biodiesel with the diesel what it leads to it leads to reduction in our import bill in a similar fashion all these marketing companies or the omcs what if they are selling you the natural gas or any other kind of gas five percent compressed biogas they have to sell so this particular mandate will also be introduced Gobardhan scheme we have already read it into detail in the schemes related lectures if you haven't watched those lectures please go and watch them I know that they are in bit detail but once you are going to cover them it is going to helpful for you next is Bhartiya Prakritik Kheti Bio Input Resource Center so over the next 10 years 1 crore farmers are going to adopt the natural farming for this 10,000 bio input resource centers are going to be set up. They are going to train, they are going to provide the resources, they are going to provide the guidelines, right? So that farmers can adopt to the natural farming. Now the ZBNF that I have for, uh, told you, zero budget natural farming, this is one of the variants of that. So there are uh, different different components under zero budget natural farming. In the one of the earlier budgets, government has said that we should be focusing more and government has allocated funding also to the zero budget natural farming. Now you are going, you guys are going to tell me one thing. Tell me which is the first organic state in India which has pioneered in the organic farming. <clears throat> which is the first organic state in India which has pioneered in the organic farming. Any guesses? Very good. Rishabh, Sikkim. So Sikkim has been the leader. No, no, no. It is Sikkim. Now next is Mishti. Building India's success in air forestation mangrove initiative for the shoreline habitats as well as the tangible incomes it has it will be taken up for the mangrove plantation now in india you can see the mangroves in the sundarbans areas of west bengal you can see by some amount of mangroves in the kutch areas as well you can see mangroves in the delta areas of your uh, this is a there is a river what is the name of the river mahanadi i guess this is upside of godavari anyone knows about it I'm just forgetting its name right now. 
I guess it is Mahanadi which flows through the Odisha. Uh, please confirm the uh, name of the river. So mangroves, these are the uh, forest areas which you can found on the delta areas, right? Wherever river meets the ocean. And in those areas, you can find the mangroves. Now, the India's largest mangroves are in the Sundarbans. Yes. Okay. So, Mahanadi, where Mahanadi uh, Delta area, there also you can find the mangroves. But the largest mangroves in India, they are in the Sundarbans area. I hope that in some of the documentaries, you might have seen it. Fine. So, mangroves are very important. Why these are important? Whenever there are storms in the seaside, it helps to prevent the soil erosion. At the same time, it provides a habitat for the fishes, correct? And there is a very rich uh, ecology that develops in the mangrove, right? So these are also called as the ecotone area in the environment language, if I call it. And there are so many benefits. It prevents the soil. It, uh, uh, it uh, helps the agriculture to prosper. See, wherever there are mangroves, they act as a shield. They prevent the seawater from getting into the agriculture fields. So hence, mangrove prevention is very important. And for that, this particular scheme has been launched called as the Mishti. And under this particular scheme, what we are going to do? We are going to do mangrove plantation. So this is it, what I wanted to discuss today. Let's discuss the another thing also, Amrit Dharohar. So government is going to pro promote the unique conservation values Right? The total number of Ramsar sites in India, our country has increased to 75, where before 2014, there were only 26. Now, what are these Ramsar sites? So, Ramsar Convention was, uh, Ramsar is a place in Iran, right? So, this was a convention which was made in the year 1972 at that time of around. And what we want to do, we want to pre uh, preserve the wetlands, right? Wetlands who are there in any kind of countries. So, in India, uh, Earlier we were having 26, then we tend to have 40, uh, around 40 and now currently we have 75, correct? <clears throat> like uh, I can tell in my state there are so many areas which has been uh, told as a Ramsar convention site. Like if you have heard about the Kevladev National Park, right? So that is also a Ramsar site in Manipur, Loktak Lake. These are some famous Ramsar sites and also these are very, uh, they are problematic, fine. They, there are some problems in these particular Ramsar sites. So, Amrit Dharohar is the scheme where we want to develop our Ramsar sites. Now, this is it. And please do search about which are the Ramsar sites in your areas. Not related to this particular uh, lecture. But it will be just for your understanding. So, thank you so much for joining in. I hope you like uh, this video. And don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you so much.